Amy Bovolsky. I'm Michelle Jawando. And this is Thinking Cap, a podcast from the Center for American Progress. Today we talk to Melissa Harris Perry. Now, lots of people remember her from the MSNBC show Melissa Harris Perry. But she is also uh, an esteemed professor, a writer, and as we discovered, a very, very, very deep thinker. You know, I um, remember the first time I connected with Melissa was not through um, media of any sort, but it was actually one of her first books. And it was Barbershop, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought. And that was way back in 2004. And I remember just reading and seeing myself um, and thoughts and the way that I kind of were, were um, approaching different issues, particularly in black community and the way that she was able to kind of capture the black hair tradition and kind of the deep political space that that is. My grandmother owned a beauty salon. Um, my mother, before she went into the ministry, actually traveled around the country doing kind of fabulous haircuts and oh. styles in her 20s. And and so there is just I need to get a, a consult, by well, the way. Well, she can definitely still okay. hook you up. She's fabulous. Um, and I just remember that so many people didn't really understand what a social gathering place and kind of political center beauty parlors and barbershops were. Mm. And that was the first time I had really read um, someone who was able to capture what that moment and where that, um, what that space was for particularly the African-American community. And so that's when I was like, oh my goodness, I love her. You know, Melissa spoke at the Women's March. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sadly at the march because I very foolishly in the weekend after the election thought, oh, the last thing I want to do is be in D.C. Right. Let's go. I told my husband, rent, rent a cabin out in the foolish. woods with our dogs yeah. and this just confine ourselves yeah. Sometimes you need to, like, no external communications with the world. That's right. And so I just watched it. And even though I said no external communication, we just watched it on TV. Right. Uh, and I felt actually very sad that I wasn't able to be there, be in D.C. in that moment and join that great energy that you felt even just from watching television at the Women's March? So it is so interesting because, um, you know, I have friends who were some of the leaders of the march, um, Tamika Mallory and Carmen Perez, who I've known for many years, and Janae Ingram, who was in charge of logistics. And so I was so proud of the work that they were doing, but I actually didn't feel the need to be hmm. there. Um, I remember when the conversation came up here, even at CAP, um, I wanted to make sure that we were connected, that there were organizations and groups that were plugging into their infrastructure. And because I, I knew the women who behind it, um, there was this validation like, it's going to be good. But I didn't feel like I needed that. And it was so funny. I was sharing this with one of our friends, Emily, um, and said, you know, I think my white homegirls needed it more than I did, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Because I felt like if this was how they were going to enter this moment of a Trump presidency and that they needed it, I needed them to go. But for me, um, you know, I often share I'm a five foot nine African last name. I'm a lawyer in a predominantly white male space, um, whether we're talking about the progressive movement or the law, just in general. And so when I walk into the room, you're already I'm, resistant. I'm already resisting. resisting. <laughs> my my existence is is in some ways resistance. And so for me, I felt like the march was more about um, I wanted my, you know, white sisters or those who were working on it to feel that connection. But I, I'm revved up and ready to go every day. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. You know, the Women's March was such an interesting moment because on one hand, it really is the driver behind a lot of the anti-Trump resistance, kind of the inaugural event mm -hmm. of what we're seeing now and all the energy we're seeing now out there. But it's also so complex mm -hmm. because, and we, we touched on this with, with Melissa, that there's a lot of... Uh, people in America who were not surprised that Trump became president That's because right. they've lived experiences right. that reflect the 
passions and the feelings that brought Trump to power in the first place. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it brought out all over the world all of these Americans uh, and and again uh, other other people worldwide, yeah, 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 who were shocked that a man who ran a campaign against women, against Muslims, against African Americans could actually be elected president. And so inherent in that march was a great deal of tension Mm -hmm. of some people feeling that the experiences of communities of color weren't recognized, Mm -hmm. that the event uh, and the way it was presented uh, was really uh, cast and formed for these new advocates Mm -hmm. And it left many people who've been in the struggle for so many years thinking, well, where were you before? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just think about um, when I organize buses of law students to come to the Affirmative Action March uh, when this was, I guess, 2004, when there was the big Grutter case before the Supreme Court. And um, and even just kind of my background, my family um, in the island of Bermuda have really been a part of kind of the civil rights um, liberation part party in on that island and so I grew up like going there every summer and seeing kind of these activists organize and this was just a part of like my family like these revolutionary fighters on this island um, were a part of that and you know I remember uh, my my great aunt who's like my grandmother um when she was knighted, actually, by the Queen of England for oh. kind of being a part. I know, it was just like crazy. It's like, Aunt Lois is now a dame. Okay, we got to call her dame now. <laughs> um, but uh, but when it really connected for me as an adult, kind of the sacrifices they constantly made to do this work. And Bermuda, it was it's a small island, but it was very much about suffrage and representation. And so those lessons were like imbued in me from a very young age. So when I came here just participating in a march or kind of writing or uh, working with elected officials, like that's what you did because that's how we saw an avenue of power. And I think if more people see themselves in the fabric of the resistance story in that way like your writing can be resistance you know your family history and your legacy is resistance and when you see yourself that way uh there's a place for you in this movement we are so thrilled to be sitting down with melissa harris perry uh who is the maya angelou presidential chair at wake forest university executive director and founding director of the anna julia cooper center she is a professor writer author activist um, and someone who i first developed a girl crush in 2004 with barbershop bibles and be E.T. I don't think I ever told you that, Melissa. But that is when I was like, yeah, she's going to have to be my friend, pretty much. That's so funny. <laughs> and we are so glad to have you on with us today on Thinking Cat. You have a girl crush, I have a gay crush. So she's really the it perfect works. guest for it's us. It's perfect. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, so, Melissa, one of the places that I wanted to start, um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about kind of resistance and finding your voice and One thing that has always been apparent about you is that you enter a room with such agency and confidence and you're often the only, you know, whether it's um, in the academic space or during your uh, time in cable news. um, And even now you occupy spaces with such an agency and in uh, a sense of self. Well, so, um, you know, it's it's interesting to hear that about myself. and I, I guess I'd, I'd answer that um, in, in two ways. One, um, that some of that is performance um, and, not, um, and not, not completely um, true to who I am in, in every moment. If, if Beyonce has Sasha Fierce, I have MHP. There you and go. so MHP, <laughs> you know, is very confident and big. But like any person, um, of course, I am, um, you know, have, have doubts and sadness and brokenness and 
Um, and, and I think it's always a, um, crucial that, um, especially for women, um, when we're talking about our humanity, and I, and I think especially for black women and for women of color, um, that we, we always acknowledge that we are human persons who break um, mm-hmm. and that that brokenness be acknowledged, because otherwise it's really easy to imagine that we are impervious um, and that we don't feel pain. And so, you know, during, for example, my years of hosting MHP show, I um, was subjected to, um, a, a, you know, a barrage on a daily basis of hateful, you know, racial and, and gendered comments, sometimes from people I knew, often from anonymous sources through social media, through email, um, you know, from death threats to rape threats, often things that my white male colleagues did not have to endure. And they were and, and remain um, painful and difficult, and they had and have a very real effect. And so part mm. of it is to just acknowledge that those, those things are painful and real. Well, Melissa, let me ask you about your time at that media company. Uh, you know, your show, I think, was a great outlet for many in the way it covered issues and the diverse voices that it brought forward. And I'm curious what you make of cable news in the era of Trump. You said at the Women's March, uh, you said, quote, I was here because this election has confirmed that mainstream broadcast media is so highly selective in the images it shows us and the voices it gives us that we can only understand this media as dishonest. I'd love to hear what you think um, of the way cable news covers Trump, of the way it moves from scandal to scandal, from story to story, and also curious um, if you were still working for a media company, how you would be covering the stories and the scandals coming out of the Trump administration, what you would be highlighting. So, um so let me begin by saying that it was um, one of the greatest professional privileges of my life to make um, MHP show. So what I see when I look at news overall, so part of it is cable news, part of it is network news, but overall what I see is a, a kind of race for eyeballs, right? Mm-hmm. And so some of those eyeballs are about ratings or it's about money, but it's not like people are sitting around a table saying, oh, how can we make money? It's literally just like these are the incentives that everybody's facing. And so what we do, right, and I'm, so I'm going to put all of us in it, right? I'm not going to, like, take myself out like I'm some kind of angelic thing over here, right? But what we're doing in this game is, all right, how do we get the eyeballs? How do we get people to listen to us? How do we get them to pay attention? Well, in this world, we have to, um, we have to put the camera on things that we know that people will look at. And so that's, you know, often that's kind of a neutral question. But in the case of an election... It's not neutral to put cameras on things um, in order to get people to look at them. Because if you put a camera on something, what happens is it takes on an inherent value. When you look at something through that camera lens, people think it's valuable simply because it's on television. That's why we have you know, the Real Housewives of every city you can name, right? Mm. <laughs> what we started doing in the, in the primaries was we knew that people would watch Hillary Clinton and people would watch Donald Trump. They would watch it not because they thought they were good, but because they were watchable. Mm. So we'd point the camera at them more often. We'd even point the camera at empty podiums because Hillary Clinton was eventually going to be standing there, (laughs) and Donald Trump was eventually going to be standing there. And yet almost the entire camera pointing, and I'm literally going to call it that, just like what we put the lens on, was on Trump. And then there was almost no discussion about it. So there was this thing that would happen, and this is why I was, while I was still on air, where you'd point the camera at Trump, Trump would come out, and he would say things like, mm, all Mexicans are rapists. And then you'd come out of it, and you'd go to the weather. All Mexicans are rapists. <laughs> Next, of course. It's a sunny um, day or, in Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's one thing to come out of, like, we need higher taxes. We need lower taxes. We need a bigger government. We need a smaller government. These are things within the American political discourse. But all Mexicans are rapists or, um, you know, we're going to ban Muslims. I'm sorry. That's actually, that's actually not within the acceptable range of American political discourse. Mm. When I saw that happening, what you can know for certain 
is that is going to begin to impact an election. It is going to make that candidate grow. It is going to ultimately affect who becomes the Republican and the Democratic um, uh, nominees. And so when I saw that happening in the primary, and look, I had only been in TV five seconds, so I know that people who had been in it five years, 10 years, 15 years, 40 years knew that the ultimate impact of that was going to be to decide who those um, Democratic and Republican nominees were, and they were they were making these choices as though they didn't know that, that was the outcome. The day after the election, many people remember 500,000 women on the march, but you talked a little bit there about kind of, is this normal? And yes, this is normal because we are black Americans and our tax dollars built glittering edifices we can't enter and solid prisons we cannot exit. And we pay the salaries of those who slaughter us. And we have never moved freely across this free land. And we came shackled in the holes of ships and we were pushed into Jim Crow's crowded ghettos and we're even now pinned in the penitentiaries of prophets. And of course this is normal because we're women and every boy and every man lays claim to our bodies. And the state's compelling interest says what to do with what's inside us. And some supposedly woke fool calls us the community's greatest a- asset while he uses us up and fathers and brothers and dates and strangers pin us and trap us and silence us as we struggle and then they call us liars if we tell you know right now there are black women muslim women immigrant trans women who feel like our our presence is constantly one of resistance and these are movements that are just everyday life and then we now find our white sisters who are joining us um, in this movement but maybe weren't there for us not maybe weren't in many cases and how do you blend kind of a lifestyle or an experience of resistance with all of these kind of white middle-aged women who are now coming into this resistance movement and we're glad that we're there but how do you blend those existence um, together and move forward? Probably the most extraordinary opportunity I had to, to think about that question was with the three of the, the women who were co-chairs of the march who um, joined us at Wake Forest University in their first public appearance after the march. And I asked them a very similar question. And it's interesting in part because they have different takes Mm -hmm. on the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, Linda Sarsour, you know, says, you know, I'll never ask you where you were before because I'm happy that you're here now. Uh, And Tamika's like, oh, no, I'm going to ask you where the hell you've been. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So... I don't think there's one answer to that. And, mm-hmm. and in fact, I would suggest that um, it's pretty unlikely that there will be a blending and that if, there, if that were, um, one, if that were an easy um, answer, if it were straightforward, if it could be done, it, it had been done. Right, right. <laughs> it would be you done. Would um, it would have been done by, because we're, we're hardly the cutest or smartest or first people to ask that question. Um, and so I presume that are far more brilliant and fabulous um, foremothers um, would have figured it out. I figure Anna Julia Cooper would have had that done. <laughs> Ida Wells would have had that work. So out, Joyner you had know. it, would have yeah, had it like so, that. So Joyner right? would have had that all handled, right? <laughs> right, in, right. You know, the 18th, 19th, the early 20th century. And so we would already be living in the, in the fruits of, um, you know, full uh, interracial feminist movement. And so um, I presume that it is, you know, part of that lesson um, that my father and mother, um, you know, a black man and a white woman taught to me um, and to my um, siblings coming through in our childhood, which is simply the struggle continues. Um, and it was a, it was such a weird lesson as a small child because I was like, I don't, I don't know you, what struggle, <laughs> what I, I don't, what are y'all talking about? Um, but it's, you know, it's helpful to me as an adult because it's just a reminder that like, our job isn't to have the answer or the solution, but to but to stay um, to stay in the hardest part of the work. And so, if you're not sort of like if you're not struggling, then you're failing. Right, um, right, right. If if you if it's if it's feeling too easy, if everybody's applauding, um, if when you walk in the room, everybody's happy to see you, 
Um, and particularly if the powerful people are happy to see you, if they feel comfortable in your presence, then you're failing because you're not challenging anybody. So mm -hmm. your job is simply mm -hmm. to be making people, and particularly powerful people, feel uncomfortable. Um, and so the, the, the question isn't so much how will we do it, but how will we just try to make some progress towards it. Um, you know, my goal in reminding us that we had already been here is simply that um, I was disturbed by this idea that somehow Mr. Trump, now President Trump, represented some great break with the American project, that this was un-American, that somehow the Trump presidency was something new. Um, n no. Um, I, it was bizarre to me, the whole election. Oh, my mm -hmm. God, there's going to be a racist in the White House? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? What are you? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. When? Mm -hmm. When was that? Uh huh. Well, of course there's gonna be a racist in the white. What? <laughs> what the hell are you talking right, about? Right. Right. Oh, there's gonna be a sexist pussy grabber in the White House. Yeah, we've had that one before. What? Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, which name the ten that weren't? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry. Like, I'm a black woman in America. The entire American project is built on grabbing black women's pussies. In, in other words, the entire American project is built on black women's reproductive labor. Mm. The whole way that the whole country is built is because black women did not control our reproductive labor. We, what we produced were more slaves. Our children did not belong to us. They belonged to the people who enslaved us, who stole not only the work that we did, but stole our children. So like, yeah, I'm sorry. It's Tuesday. Next. <laughs> now, that, Water is wet. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't make me like it, it, but resistance against racism and sexism and, you know, sexual coercion is what I do. So it is not fun. It is not enjoyable. It is not, but it is also not surprising. And it is certainly not surprising that it shows up in the White House. It is that just makes it Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. So, yep, here we go. Now, oh, are y'all coming? Great. Great. Here. <laughs> but if you don't come, I, I'm not going to be shocked. I'm curious to hear, maybe just for my own selfish reasons of doing resistance work, think about pushing uh, and channeling the resistance energy that's out there in a way that bridges this kind of divide, uh, shines a light on what you've just said about uh, the the fact that this kind of struggle communities of color have had to endure for decades in this country, that it is in fact part of the American story, and that maybe then this moment is an opportunity um, to expand our understanding of what it means to be American and the experiences that people live with, that it's not this, oh, all of a sudden, you know, we have to resist Trump, but no, this is an honor ongoing struggle and we have to bring in all of America with us as we march towards progress. So I think the, the tough part about that is that it's um, easier to focus on an individual um, enemy who can be vanquished in some um, limited time period than to talk about structural change. So it is always easier to beat Trump in four years or two years or eight years and believe that in beating Trump in that moment, we will fix the problem than to say, hey, how about racism? <laughs> mm, <laughs> because, right, right. you know, racism, man, that's hard. White supremacy is some sticky residual shit that you might have to deal with, right? <laughs> beat Trump is like like guaranteed, we, we like, we're on a count that like guaranteed there was like an eight year clock counting no matter what, right? So you like you just know you're gonna get a win on that at some point, <laughs> um, and like beat Trump also allows you to do fun things like you know mock hilarious hashtags that happen accidentally in the night and make you feel -fe -fe. better because you you know you've never misspelled anything on Twitter ever. <laughs> so much better and smarter and funnier and right. liberal, right? <laughs> I'm like y'all y'all keep it up because the story of my life I, right here. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's funny. I mean, it is. It is. It's funny. Don't get me wrong. But like, 
but like also the reason that the Obama White House never misspelled a hashtag is because it also took them like six weeks to approve a hashtag. <laughs> I mean, this shit was crazy. Like, I'm sorry, it's the internet. It moves faster than that. Right. Y'all got to go. Let's right. go. Let's right. go. Let's go. Right. So like you can mock <laughs> Trump, but he also is way better overall at the whole internet thing because so I mean so I get it like on the one hand he is he's mockably hilarious but he also absolutely beat Clinton at the internet because he used it more effectively just did because truth is people just don't care if the internet is spelled right because it's the internet that's mm-hmm. the whole point mm-hmm. like so as long as y'all are fact checking it and spelling it right and taking a week and a half to do it, you will miss it because it's the internet. So no one cares if it's spelled right. That's what makes it the internet. Stop it. Like the New York Times has to be spelled right. Twitter right. is not. Here we go. Right. Let's but, go. <laughs> like, and, oh God. Uh, I mean, it's why the millennials can't spell, but it, they won't, it won't matter. But here we go because. Because I, I get it. People are like, how do we get all the people to understand the struggle? Be- because what we want to do, what we are enjoying, what we are having a good time with is pointing and laughing at Trump. And I get it. I do. Trust me. But it, we, we look ridiculous because it's just that's not the point. Mm-hmm. I'm happy that the flag of the Confederacy no longer flies in South Carolina. I'm thrilled that the Confederate monuments are coming down in new orleans and around the country but i'm telling you that flags and monuments and individuals as important and critical and crucial as they are and as much as let's do it let's do that no one is saying we shouldn't but but that is not the thing those are just the symbols of the thing trump may be a symbol of this thing that you want to root out but beating Trump is not the thing to resist. Trump is not the thing to resist. The question is, what is it that Trump represents to the thing that you want to resist? Is it, um, you know, is it that he represents to you racism? Is it that he represents populism? Is it Islamophobia? Because that is the thing that you must resist. He's going to be gone eventually. We are, have term limited presidencies. But if, but if you resist him without resisting the rest, it just it will not matter. Melissa, thank you so much for being so generous with your time thank and you, joining thank us you, thank you. here on Thinking Cap. Thinking Cap is produced by Sally Tucker. Music by Kyle Epstein and Jacob Buchanan. Graphics by Matt Ingram. For more, find us at Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and at AmericanProgress.org, or wherever you want. <laughs>